The verse that I wanted to focus on for the sermon and I was in verse 29 where the Bible read, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. And the title of my sermon tonight is Hasty of Spirit. Hasty of Spirit. I think a lot of ways people can be hasty. And I think if we take just the primary application of this verse, we see that it's in, the, it's in regards to anger. Or we see it's in regards to uh, of, of being of uh, great wrath. Because it says there at the beginning of that verse, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Meaning if something were to irritate you or to greatly anger you, the Bible is saying it's not good to just immediately come to wrath. It's not, it's not good to just immediately pour out your wrath and your anger onto somebody. But you should not be hasty. You should not be hasty of spirit because guess what's going to happen? You're going to make a foolish decision. When you just make a quick judgment to go to wrath, maybe you're going to, in hindsight, or after the fact, realize, hey, I shouldn't have got that angry. Hey, maybe I misread the situation. Hey, maybe I didn't understand what this person was really doing. And if you just take in the time to just wait, find out more details, maybe meditate on the situation or, or whatever angered, angered you a little bit, you would have realized, that's not something for me to get angry about. That's not something for me to pour out my wrath on this person. Hey, I did the same thing five minutes ago. Why don't I give this person a little bit of grace? We see, hasty of spirit can be a lot of different things. But let's focus on what it would be in anger. So go to Proverbs chapter 15, if you would. Flip back just a cut, or flip forward, just one to verse 18. It says, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. So he's saying, look, a wrathful man, he's going to stir up a lot of strife. Whenever you get angry and you start bringing your wrath, it's going to bring a lot of contention. It's going to bring a lot of strife. People are going to get really upset. It's going to make the situation worse. It's not going to make the situation better. He's saying, look, be slow to anger. Slow to anger is going to appease the strife. You know, there might be some kind of contention there, but if you don't respond to their provoking you, maybe. Maybe they're trying to get you to, you know, bring them some of the wrath. So, well, we see this in, like, sports all the time, right? I mean, constantly players are trying to provoke one another and get them to, you know, pour out a little wrath so they get a penalty or they can, you know get them on edge, or get them distracted from what they're really trying to do. We see maybe Satan's a lot of times just trying to provoke you, or your enemies are trying to provoke you just to distract you, to get your mind off the things that you should be doing. Look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Now, I think the, by, this verse is making it clear that this is not necessarily something that's very easy or something that's just natural. It's saying, look, this is going to take some you know, strength. I mean, you're better than a mighty. You're better than someone that's trained physically and is very strong and is a great warrior and can go out and take a whole city. Just by being able to control your spirit, that's going to be a great victory in your life. But we see it's not going to just come with ease. You're not just going to overnight, oh, now all of a sudden I control all my anger and I can control all the bad situations. Because most people, when they're sober, they're like, well, I wouldn't get angry. You know, I wouldn't just quickly get mad at somebody and punch them or say something mean or pour out some wrath. It's really easy to say when you're not mad. It's when you get in that situation and someone's really provoking you and they're really on your nerves and they just make that comment about one of your family members or, or something in your life that just really irritates you. At that moment when you're, you're going to be the weakest. And that's when the Bible's saying, look, you've got to be slow to anger if you want to uh, be better than the mighty there. But people today, they blow up at a lot of little things too. It's not just big things. It's not just, you know, somebody really having a, 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 a comment against you that just really means a lot or something. Sometimes it's just little things. I mean, it could be even, not even a direct statement. You make an indirect statement about somebody and they get all upset about it. They get all frustrated. You're not even trying to say anything mean. It's just they blow up at you. You say, well, you know, uh, this, this meal is really good tonight. Oh, so all the meals, you know, in the, in the past weren't good? You know what I mean? You're like, no, I'm just saying this meal's really good tonight. What are you trying to say? I can't cook oh, other nights? I mean, people can just blow up for any kind of reason. I mean, maybe, you know, your wife's like, hey, you're looking good today. It's like, what? I don't look good every day? What? I mean, you know, people just blow up for the littlest things today. And obviously, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to follow what Proverbs is teaching us, we shouldn't be hasty of spirit. We shouldn't just immediately react to every situation. A lot of times people aren't even trying to be negative or mean or don't even realize what they're saying might be hurting your feelings. And so we should give them the benefit of the doubt. 
We should let some time pass. We should try to clarify situations. The Bible says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. The Bible says in Proverbs 103.8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Even if someone does provoke you or say something mean or ugly, I mean, just pass over the transgression. Just let it go. That's what the Bible teaches. Go to John chapter 2 if you would. You know, some people would wrongfully say that it's, just, it's bad to always be angry. It's bad to ever get angry. It's bad to ever get mad. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does say in Psalms 119, it says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I truly believe that you getting offended and your love for the law are directly connected, is what the Bible teaches. If you truly love God's Word with all your heart and you're trying to observe His commandments, nothing's going to offend you. You're not going to be offended with this world when they curse and swear and blast. I mean, you're not going to be, uh, it's not going to personally offend you. Obviously, if someone takes the name of the Lord in vain, you know, I don't like that, okay? I mean, but I'm just saying, it's not going to personally offend me. If someone, you know, calls me all names under the sun, that's not going to personally offend me if I know what the Bible says. I mean, the Bible says to leap for joy when men persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. So if you're living right and you're following God's commandments, and you really have a love for the law, you're not going to be easily offended. You're not going to let the little things bother you, even when it comes to a brethren. Because when it comes to brethren, you're supposed to pass over transgression. You're supposed to love your brother. You're supposed to bless them that curse you. I mean, you're supposed to love your enemies. Even when Saul is persecuting David, I mean, he has great love towards Saul. You see that we don't see him getting really angry with Saul. We don't see him pouring out wrath against Saul. No, he's taking all these transgressions. I mean, Saul literally threw a javelin at him. I mean, talk about somebody trying to do something against you. I mean, but we see he comes back and plays the harp again. And then he throws, his, he throws a javelin at him again. And then he's chasing him across the country trying to kill him. But David's kindling that wrath. He's going to say, well, the Lord's going to repay. You know, I'm not going to stretch forth my hand against God's anointed. And, you know, we shouldn't try to revenge ourselves against the brethren or the unsaved. God will, God will take care of that. So we need to try our best to not to be slow of anger and to a slow of wrath. But that's not to say that anger doesn't have its place. Okay? The Bible does teach that there would be a time to be angry. It says in Ephesians 4.26, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So having a natural emotion of anger in itself is not a sin. There's nothing wrong with being angry. It's how do you respond in that anger. What is your response? Are you going to just immediately pour out your wrath? Are you just going to be hasty of spirit? Or are you going to have righteous anger? We see in John chapter 2, look at verse 14. Let's see what Jesus did when he got angry. It says in John chapter 2, verse 14, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and some of them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So you see, Jesus Christ, what does he do? Well, first of all, he makes a small cord of whips. Now, I don't know how long that takes, but I'm, not, I'm imagining it probably took a little bit of time. I mean, he's sitting there, he's making his, his whip of cords. And we see when he's making this whip of cords, he's probably thinking about why he's angry. He's thinking about, you know, what's going on. Now, some people get really angry today, or they would, they would attack the Bible for saying, well, you should never throw anybody out of church. You should never get anybody out of church. That's not the spirit of Christ. You know, that's not loving. What did Christ do? I mean, he didn't just throw people out of church. He whipped them out of church. I mean, he's throwing the tables. I mean, he's getting out there whipping them and, and rebuking them. But we see, it's not wrong to have anger. It's not wrong to follow God's commandments that are biblical. But we see, he wasn't hasty of spirit. I mean, he took the time. He's baking his cord of whips. We see that Jesus Christ would have never committed any sin. The Bible says in Amos chapter 5, verse 15, Hate the evil and love the good. And establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. We are supposed to hate evil. We're supposed to hate sin. We're supposed to hate wickedness. And we don't want that anywhere around us. The Bible, the Bible teaches, you know, I hate them with perfect hatred. I mean, there's, there's time and place for hatred. There's a time and place for anger. The Bible says there's a time of love and a time of hate. 
I mean, we have these emotions, but how do we respond to them? I think when someone is angry, and you check it with the Bible, and it's, hey, I'm supposed to hate the evil. I'm actually upset about sin. I'm actually upset about something the Bible is saying, this is wrong. The Bible says to judge righteous judgment. If I'm looking at the Bible, and this is a wicked sin, that we see admonition in the Bible of how to react in that situation, it's not wrong to then follow through. It's not wrong to rebuke somebody when they're in great sin. You know, maybe you're angry because someone committed a grievous sin against you or did something. The Bible says rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 to cast out all the fornicators and the extortioners and the covetous and the drunkards and the railers with such an one know not to eat. We see it's not unbiblical to be upset about someone bringing that kind of sin into the church and trying to affect other people. But we shouldn't be hasty of spirit. We shouldn't be uh, quick to just judge people in every single situation. We should, you know, if it's just a minor thing, why don't you just pass over the transgression? I think the example we see with Jesus here is that he took a little bit of time to think about what he was going to do. Even when the Pharisees brought the uh, woman that was caught in adultery unto him, the Bible makes it clear he didn't immediately even answer them. He sat there and just kind of ignored them and took a little while, and then eventually he gave his judgment unto them. He said, you know, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. But I think the righteous thing for a Christian to do is not make an immediate quick judgment. Take the time, look at what the Bible says, meditate upon his word, let his word, you know, dwell richly in your heart. Don't just make a quick judgment. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a time and a place to be angry. We should just make sure if we're going to do that, it's judging righteous judgment. The Bible says, He that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. And I would say like 99% of the time, I mean, you probably should let it go. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea, okay? I mean, 99% of the time, your, your brother sins against you, just let it go. I mean, I'm, I don't think we should just be going around just rebuking every person for every little thing or every little grievance or something that we don't agree about or something that's not right. But when somebody's in fornication, when somebody's a drunk, when somebody's doing one of these grievous sins that the Bible clearly lines, hey, maybe you could take that person aside and say, hey, look, brother, you're in grievous sin. I don't want you bringing this in here. You know, or they trespass against you greatly with some kind of a, a, a grievous trespass. I mean, maybe there's a time and place. We ought to be quick to forgive and slow to anger. Quick to forgive our brethren and slow to anger. Let's go to Titus chapter 1. I have a lot of different points I want to cover. I think when it comes to being hasty, it could really be a lot of things. We see the, the primary ap application of that verse was talking about anger. It was talking about wrath. You know, but we could be hasty in a lot of things. I remember not too long ago, it was a couple weeks ago, I usually take the trash out on Thursdays because they pick it up on Friday mornings. And so after church is kind of late, so I'm kind of tired, I'm kind of frustrated, and I'm going into my boy's bedroom and I'm trying to get their uh, trash from their diaper pail. And their diaper pail has this really special trash bag that you have to kind of insert a real special way. And I didn't know what to do. And it has real clear instructions just like right on the front of it. But instead of just reading the clear instructions, I just rip it open and I start like pulling the paper and I'm like trying to figure it out. And I just like almost even ruined the entire trash bag. Because it's like this big circle and you're not supposed to open it. I mean, it says real big on the front of it, like, do not open right here. And I'm just like ripping it open. Why? Because I was too hasty. Because I was just too quick. I was too much in a hurry. And you know what? It would have probably taken like 10 seconds to do it right. But instead it took like 10, 20, 30 minutes to try and roll it all the way back up. And try and get it in the exact same spot that it was supposed to be. And then put it all the way back in. A lot of times when you're hasty, you're not going to even save any time. You're just going to not do the things right that you're supposed to do, and you're not going to have to redo them later. We should, be, we should be taking our time. We should be patient and make sure that everything we do is in the proper timing, is in the proper way, that we shouldn't just be hasty. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, 
holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now we have a very clear passage here, and we have another parallel passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that say almost the same exact same things, there's a few differences, that give the qualifications of a bishop, the qualifications of a pastor, the qualifications of an elder. But you know, a lot of people in their zeal, they want to just go out and be a pastor without actually meeting the qualifications of a bishop. They say, well, I don't have any children, but I mean, we, we need pastors, so I'll just go out and start a church. Or, hey, I don't really meet any of these qualifications, but, you know, I just, I just going to go out and start a church. I'm not even married. I'm just going to start a church in my basement. I've got my buddies over. Call me elder so-and-so. I mean, that's not how you're supposed to do it. We shouldn't be hasty of spirit. Because guess what? God's not going to bless that. If a man goes out and just starts his own church called Joseph Smith, he's not going to bless it. <laughs> God doesn't bless the church begets the church. Elders ordain elders. And you know, elders should ordain elders that are qualified according to the Bible. Yep. Now, when it comes to these qualifications, I believe they're sufficient. So if someone meets the qualifications, I'm not going to stand in judgment of, you know, how quick they go out. That's not what I'm trying to say here, okay? If someone meets the qualifications of, the, of a bishop, you know, Paul's like, let's get him going. Let's get him in every city. Come on, there's an urgency. Okay? But the urgency isn't to just regard, disregard the Bible. Disregard the qualifications of a bishop. Because, you know, the guy that doesn't qualify according to the Bible, how is he going to preach this part of the Bible? How is a guy that doesn't have children going to stand up and rip on pastors needing to have children? He can't do it. I mean, unless he's going to be a complete hypocrite. I mean, hey, pastors got to have children. I know I don't, but, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't make any sense. The guy can't, can't fulfill all the Bible. What if his children aren't in order? Is he going to really get up and rip on, you know, parents needing to be able to discipline their children? He that spared the rod hated the son. Oh, but I don't do that. Oh, but I don't have my kids under control. My kids are down here just screaming and yelling and tearing up the place. And everybody's like, I don't want my kids to be like his kids. How much respect do you can have for a sermon that a pastor gets up and preaches about parenting when his kids are just out of control? When his kids aren't even right? And we see the Bible is giving these admonitions for a reason. It's not for no reason. And the guy that doesn't follow these qualifications, he's not going to be able to preach effectively. He's not going to be able to follow God's commandments the way that you would have him do it. He can't preach the whole Bible. And if you're not going to follow a part of the clear Bible, the person in the pew knows it. I mean, the people in the pew know it many times, especially in an you know, independent Baptist church, especially. Maybe to other churches they might know, not know it. But anybody that actually cares about the Bible, actually cares about what it says, they're going to look at this verse and they're going to say, wow, it's obvious this guy's not even qualified to be a pastor. So they're going to come to one of two conclusions. Either this guy's wrong, or it's, you know, the Bible's just kind of like good guidelines. It's just kind of good suggestions. You know, there's an area in my life where I don't really know if I should follow that part of the Bible. It's not that big a deal for me to not follow it. Because look, the pastor's not even following the qualifications of a bishop, and it just gives everybody license to sin. It's just a reproach unto Christ. If he doesn't have a high regard for Scripture, how can you have a high regard for the King James Bible when you're not even going to follow it for the office of a bishop? If you don't meet the qualifications of a bishop, you should just sit down and let someone that does qualify get up and preach the Word of God. And you say, well, we need churches everywhere in this country and everywhere in the world. You know what's not going to help our movement? If we have a whole bunch of guys go out and start churches that aren't qualified according to the Bible. That's not going to help us. That's not going to be good in the long term. This world does not need more unqualified pastors. It needs more qualified pastors. You know, and if a guy meets the minimum qualifications, great, go, start a church. Start tearing it up. I'm not going against people that, you know, barely meet the qualifications. I'm talking about people that just clearly don't. They just, they're not even kind of close. Or maybe they, you know, if you're 9 out of the 10, why don't you just wait till you get to the 10th one going? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, a young man that's wanting to be a pastor, he may be a pastor for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. What's waiting one more year to make sure that you have a high regard of Scripture? Because, you know, once you start that church, in my opinion, your pedigree is kind of sealed forever. I mean, hey, this is who I was when I started the church. I mean, you can't change that. Why? You might as well get it right. You know, if some guy found himself in that situation, because, you know, Bible colleges today, they'll just send out anybody and their cat to go start a church. You know, maybe, you know, if the guy finally does meet the qualifications, 
great, you know, continue being a pastor. If you meet the qualifications now, I mean, put those things behind. Reach forward to those things which are before. I mean, I don't think that you should just, you know, jump in a lake, okay? But I'm just saying, let's let qualified men preach the Bible. Let's let qualified men go out and preach the Word. Let's not be too hasty in our decisions, because I want God's blessing. If I were to go out and start a church, I don't want to just be in clear violation of the Bible, of the, of, the, of the picture that God gives us, of the clear commandments He gives us of what a bishop's supposed to be like. Go to Numbers chapter 17 if you would. The Bible says in Jeremiah 14, it says, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught, and to the seed of heart. Oh, I think all pastors are sent from God. No. There's a lot of pastors that are not sent by God. God makes that clear. He says, these prophets, hey, I didn't send them. I didn't give them any commandment. Neither did I even speak to them. You know what? The guy that doesn't meet the qualifications of a bishop, when God's speaking in his Bible to the bishops, he's not speaking to that guy. He's not commanding them. He's not sending them. No, you've got to be following God's commandments. Look at Numbers 17, verse 1. Then the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers. Of all their princes according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of the fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony, where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. So we see here, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, but all the children of Israel, there's some, they had Nathan and Abiram and, and Korah, they were, they were going against Moses. They said, hey, Moses, why are you special? All, all the congregations holy. We've seen Moses go up on the mountain, he's getting the commandments of God, and these other guys are starting to envy Moses. They're starting to say, hey, why is he the only one that's in charge? We should be in charge too. We're holy. We're righteous. And we see later God's going to say, hey, I've already ordained Levi. I've already ordained Aaron. They're going to be the priests. They're going to be the ones in charge of the service. But just to clear it up one last time, he has one man from every tribe come and bring a rod, come and bring a staff, and they're going to present it. And the Lord says, the one that I've ordained, the one that I've chosen is going to bud. It's going to bring forth this budding. Look back at chapter 16, verse 10, or verse 9. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? And he hath brought thee near to him, and thy brethren the sons of Levi with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? So he's speaking to Korah and, and Nathan and Abiram. He's saying, look, you're already set apart in a way. All the children of Israel set apart the fact that they got to worship God as the children of Israel to serve him. Now only one tribe, the tribe of Levi, was going to be the priest. He's saying, why can't you just be content that you're serving me? That you're in the congregation. That you're in the church. Do you also have to be the priest? Do you just have to be the pastor? Do you just have to be the guy in charge? I mean, that's basically what he's saying. We see some people that come in, they can't be satisfied to just go to the right church, to just go to a God-filled church, a Spirit-filled church that's going out preaching the Gospel, that's following God's Word, that's serving Him in spirit and truth. I've got to be in charge. i just got to be the guy in charge. I've got to be the guy that's getting all the recognition. So what do they want to do? They want to forsake God's commandments and lift themselves up and put themselves in a position of power. That's what they want to do. We see it's the same thing with a guy that doesn't meet the qualifications of a pastor that's just going to self-ordain himself. Or just, you know, i got to be a pastor. I don't meet the qualifications, but I just want to be a pastor. It's the spirit of Korah. We see that later in the story, only Aaron's rod buds. You know, I think it's a picture when it comes to the staff of what a shepherd. What is a pastor like? He's the shepherd. God's ordained him to be the shepherd over the people. To, to take care of the flock. Feed the flock. Feed the sheep. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 if you would. It says in Ezekiel 34, I'll just read for you. It says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. 
It says because, and they were scattered because there was no shepherd in Ezekiel chapter 34. It says in verse 8, that because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search for the flock. It says in verse 10, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds. Now it's interesting, for sake of time, I'm going to skip it, but he was saying, look, there's these shepherds in Israel, I'm against them. And he's saying, well, the people were scattered because there was no shepherd. And he said, there's no shepherd. And then later he says, I'm against the shepherds. And you say, well, that's a contradiction. He's saying there's shepherds, and then there's not shepherds. He's just saying the point of the fact that, look, there's a lot of pastors out there today that call themselves a pastor, that pretend to be a pastor, that look like a pastor. But God's saying, look, my people are scattered because there's no pastor anywhere. There's no one that's meeting the qualifications of a bishop that's standing in a gap like Aaron did. He stood in the gap. But you know what? He's against those pastors. Even though they call themselves a pastor, they're not a true pastor. What makes you a true pastor? If a man, you know, is he going to be a bishop, he must be blameless. The Bible's not saying, well, maybe hope so. Maybe kind of. No, if you're a pastor, you're blameless. So that's my second point. Third point I had tonight, a way that people are hasty. Look at verse 13. It says, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. A way that a lot of people are hasty in this country is through fornication. They're not willing to wait for marriage anymore. They're not willing to satisfy that desire within marriage. So they have to go out and they have to commit fornication. We see, this is a major sin. And not only is it a major sin, but you're not going to be pleased with this decision. When you go out and you just make a hasty decision, you're going to realize it was foolish later. You're going to realize it was a bad decision later. Right. If you commit fornication before you get married, you're going to be really upset with that when you, after you get married. Or maybe if you don't even get married, and you just commit fornication just over and over and over, if you then do want to get married or later get married, you're going to bring a lot of baggage in that relationship. You're going to ruin the gift that God's given to people within marriage. We see when you're hasty and you can't wait, you're going to ruin a lot of things. We shouldn't be hasty of spirit. Look at verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It's not going to be good for you if you commit fornication. Look at chapter 7, verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. You know, if you commit fornication before you get married, you're going to have a lot of regrets in your life. You're going to regret that decision. Uh, go to Proverbs chapter 28. I'll read for you from 2 Samuel 13. It says, Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that he hate, the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. You know, the Bible talks about people committing fornication. It always brings up this story how after the fact they hate the person. Yeah. Because, you know, fornication, a lot of people are like, Oh, I have strong desire and strong feelings for this person. But then after they commit that act, after they commit this sin, a lot of times they feel differently about the person. They say, wow, I really like this girl. She was so nice and so kind and so godly. But then after she just let me commit fornication with her, she must be a whore. I mean, she must be a harlot. I don't even want to be around her anymore. And that's not fair to the woman. I'm just saying what happens. When a girl is just easy, a guy doesn't like it anymore. He was going for the chase. He was going for the kill. And once he gets it, he moves on. Once he gets it, he feels differently about the woman. We see Amnon. He's desiring his sister. He's desiring his sister. And then when he gets what he wants, he's done with her. He hates her more than he loved her at the beginning, is what the Bible says. And we even see this in uh, Ezekiel. It talks about two sisters that are whores. And it says that as soon as he saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them in Chaldea. And the Babylonians came, under, came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with the whoredom. And she was polluted with them. And her mind was alienated from her. So even the woman, sometimes when the man finally gets what she wants, she may have a lot of resentment towards him. She may have a lot of resentment to the fact that he didn't, you know, think that she was precious, think that she was special, think that she was worth, uh, you know, being with even though she wouldn't just give in. There's a lot of resentment and anger and hatred that comes with fornication. When you're hasty of spirit, you're going to make bad decisions. And there's going to be a lot of consequences to those decisions. Look at, did I have you turn to Proverbs 28? Look at verse 19. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. So not only can you be hasty of spirit in regards to anger, to people you know, not qualifying to 
the offices of God and just decided to go out in their own zeal, even though they're going against the commands of God. Not only can you do that within the outside the bounds of marriage, going out committing fornication. I think probably one of the things that affects most people's riches is trying to acquire wealth too quickly. Trying to go out and just acquire a massive amount of riches, a massive amount of wealth very quickly. Why? We see you go down to the, the, the store today, the convenience store. What do you have? Lottery. I mean, you have all these get-rich-quick schemes. You have people playing the stock market. You have people trying to do all these type of things, trying to get money. Pyramid schemes and Ponzi schemes and all kinds of door-to-door -door sales and all kinds of gimmicks and frauds and phonies. And people are just constantly trying to get rich quick because they think that'll solve all their problems and that'll make them, you know, happier. But what did this say? It says, But he that followed after vain persons shall have poverty enough. But look at the first part of this. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. You know, the person that goes out and just decides, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to just go out and get quick riches. I'm just going to work hard. What's the Bible say? He's going to have plenty of bread. If you go out with the, with the, I'm just going to work hard. I'm not trying to get rich. I'm not laboring to be rich, as the Bible says. But I'm just going to go out and work hard by the sweat of my brow. The Bible says God's going to give you plenty of bread. You're going to have plenty enough. You know, riches isn't going to give you happiness. Look at verse 20. A faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. And you know, this is, this is true as the day is long. These get-rich-quick schemes, these Ponzi schemes, they're just cheating people and stealing money and defrauding people. You know, I almost got caught up in one of these things. When I was uh, working for a bank, I was getting really interested. There's these people that, instead of renting houses, what they do is they'll do this for sale by owner type option. But then they'll finance the property for the people. And they charge them these exorbitant interest rates. They'll charge them like 18 or 20 or 25 or 26. I mean, just huge amounts of interest just for these people to own their own home. What they'll usually do is people that are poor... They'll get, you know, four or $5,000 check in the mail after tax season. And so, you know, these people say, hey, give us four or $5,000 down, and for $700 or $600 a month, you know, we'll, have, we'll let you have this house. And we'll finance it. Because most of these people can't qualify for a mortgage. I mean, the qualifications to get a mortgage today in this country are very high. So there's these people that are in a bad situation. And these predators, these predatory lending practices, they go after these people and they just take even more money from them. I mean, they just keep taking from the poor. They go out and they say, you know, hey, sign your mortgage. And what happens is most of these people just default. They can't end up paying after a few months or a few years. And they just foreclose on them and then they sell it again and then they sell it again. So they're just taking their four or five grand, you know, on that initial uh, entry whenever they try to buy the house. And they're just charging these 15, 17, 20, 25% interest rates. I mean, it is so bad that you're literally going to make like 10 to 15 times more money than the house is worth. I mean, we're talking back to where I live, houses would be like 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars. I mean, you're going to you're going to charge them like 250 thousand dollars over the life of that loan with these exorbitant interest rates. I mean, they're just stealing from the poor, just outright from their pocket. You know, and I, I'll be honest, I actually entertained the idea. I thought, hey, maybe I could do this. This is a good way to make money. This is a good way to get riches. But I wasn't really thinking about it, you know, very soberly. And once I was realizing, you know, they, they tried to trick you. They said, oh, you're helping people. Because otherwise they could never buy a house. That's not helping people. And the Bible, you know, it condemns usury. It condemns usury of 1%. Not even 15 and 17 and 20. I mean, even just mortgages today, they're just robbing people blind. I mean, just you go to the mortgage and you get a 5% mortgage or a 3% mortgage, you're going to pay three times the amount of the loan over the life of that loan. Yeah. And, you know, they're, the bankers today, they're just laughing all the way to the bank. I mean, they're, they literally are the most corrupt and evil and wicked people in their hearts. They're just consumed with money. And the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And it is so true. I remember sitting in a banking meeting, and these bankers are looking at this guy's uh, balance sheet. He lived in, like, New York or something. He had all these businesses and things that he owned. He had, like, a billion-dollar net worth. Just, I mean, not something you see every day when you're working in the bank. Most people, much less than that. But he had it. 
And they just, it was like they were just feasting their eyes on the greatest meal you've ever seen or the greatest love. I mean, they were just, this is like drools coming out of their mouth. They're just like, look at all those assets and look at, look at all those houses and look at all this. That's literally what banks are like. That's literally what these people are like. And if you consume yourself with riches, if you consume yourself with the love of money, you're going to be making a lot of ethically bad decisions. You're going to justify a lot of wicked things. You're going to try and come up with reasons why it's okay to just rob and steal from the poor and just take advantage of them completely. Because look, you're completely taking advantage of these poor people that just don't have a chance. They don't have, they don't have any you know, money to their name. They're just kind of you know, down on their luck. That's what these people do. It is wicked. It says, He that hastens to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. That's why the Bible said that the rich shall not be innocent. Because these people that are getting rich quick, they're not going to be innocent. They're going to be robbing from the blind. They're going to be violating God's commandments. They're going to be committing all kinds of violence and wickedness and just all kinds of filth. Go to uh, Proverbs 13, if you would. You know, the Bible said in Luke chapter 15, it's talking about a parable, it said, and he, had, and he said, a, man, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided it unto him his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and they began to be in want. People say, oh, if I won the lottery, everything would just work out for me. Well, to see a guy who gets his entire inheritance in just one lump sum. I mean, he gets the cash out from the lottery. He's fun big. What is he going to do? He's just going to go waste it all and riot his living right away. And then what? He's going to be in want for the rest of his life. He's just going to waste it all. Winning the lottery is going to be the worst thing that happens to any person. Because they're just going to waste it all. They're just going to spend it on riotous living, and then they're going to be in, the, in want for the rest of their life. That's not going to bring you any happiness. Look at Proverbs 13, verse 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. You know, it's nothing wrong to grow in wealth and grow and increase by working by the sweat of your brow, by working hard, by being diligent, by doing good. We see a lot of men in the Bible in the Old Testament, they became wealthy in the latter parts of their life through what? Working hard every single day. We see Jacob worked very hard. And at the end of his life, God's blessing him and sending him out to have all the cattle, Laban's cattle. We see a lot of men like Abraham. He didn't want to get the rich quick scheme. What happened? He got all the goods back from Sodom whenever he went out to, to fight the kings. And he's like, I don't want any of these goods. Lest you say that, you know, I've been rich other than by God. He was going to be blessed by God. He was just going to take the riches that came to him by working hard, by being diligent. He didn't want the hasty riches. He didn't want just the quick, get rich quick scheme. He didn't want to just get the winning ticket number. He wanted to get it by working hard. But you know, today, the young people, they fall for this trap, and they want to live it up now. They don't want to go out and work hard. They don't want to go work out hard in their young life. They want to go to college first. They want to get all these student loans. And they just want to live it up. Hey, let's go, you know, drinking and partying and just have a good time. I don't need a job right now. I can worry about that later. Let's just live it up now and let's just have a good time and let's just enjoy the college life. Hey, let's even go travel and let's just, you know, I'm young. I'm not going to want to travel no more. Let's just travel now. I don't need to get a job. I don't need to think about these. Let's just go backpacking through Europe and let's just have a good old time. Why should I worry about those things now? Let's just live it up. And you know, not only that, but maybe they do get that first job, and they just immediately go out and buy this big fancy house that they can't afford, and this big fancy car that they can't afford. They're not willing to just work hard, and work by the sweat of their brow, and be humble for a long time, and then slowly, gradually get to that wealth. They want to max out the credit cards, they want to get all this loan and all this debt, and they want to just put themselves in these heavy burdens. The Bible says in Lamentations 3.27, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. You know, young men today, they need to just go out and work hard and be diligent. And all the riches will come later if what? If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. You know, if you're seeking God and you're seeking him first and you're working diligent, you're going to have plenty of bread. You're going to have plenty of the things that you need in this life. 
You don't need all these riches and all these fancy things anyways. I think it's just going to pull you away from God and serving God. But we shouldn't be trying to desire to live it up when we're young. We should be wanting to work hard when we're young. The Bible says that, uh, I'm not going to be able to quote it, but it says like the, the, the best thing about young men is their strength, is the fact that they're being strong, and the gray hair for the old man. I mean, the Bible makes it clear that the best part about a young man is his strength. The fact that he can go out and work hard, work long hours, because you're not always going to be like that. You're not always going to be able to do that. I think that's a, that could be for physical labor and spiritual labor. We need to work hard as young men. We not to be hasty to be rich. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 35 if you will. Here's another way that people can be hasty. They can be hasty to persecution. You say, hasty to persecution? What does that mean? If people, they don't want to be persecuted rightly, or they don't want to be persecuted for doing the right things, they just want to go out and just get some persecution right away. They just want to like look for it. They want to go out and stand on the, you know, the, the, the sodomite parade and go scream at a bunch of homos and have them yell at them, Hey, I'm being persecuted! That's not what God's calling you to do. Philippians chapter 1, verse 15 says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. You know what? Yea, and all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You don't have to look for persecution. You don't have to go out and look for people to persecute you and to hate you and to speak all manner of evil against you. If you just live godly and you just follow God's commandments, it will come. You know, some people today, they want to go out looking for it. They want to go and like do this street preaching or this obnoxious evangelism where they're just getting in people's faces and like rebuking them and screaming at them. Look, Paul said that he's going to preach Christ and Him crucified. If you're talking to an unsaved person, the only thing you should tell them is the gospel. I don't think you should get up and just be rebuking all their sin to their face and you know just condemning them and saying you look like a whore and you look like you know a whoremonger and you're such a you're like a murderer in your heart. Look at that satanic shirt on you're wearing. I mean, these people are unsaved. What do you expect? Why would they follow God's commandments if they don't even believe on Jesus Christ? That doesn't even make any sense. Get them to the first base. Get them, to sec get them baptized. Then, then, after they're coming to church, then teach them all that Christ had commanded them. Right? right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Let's go to first base and second base, and then let's teach them. It'd be like trying to sit a baby down, I mean, and you're trying to give them a lecture. That's not going to do anything for the baby. Okay. A baby doesn't under you got to get them to the stages. they got to grow a little bit. Give them a little time to be mature. If you go out and you just scream at babies, they're just going to scream back at you. I mean, it's pretty clear. You don't have to go and look out for persecution. It'll come. Look at 2 Chronicles 35, 19. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me not commanded me to make haste. Forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him. And hearkened not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. The servants therefore took him out of the chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died, and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned after Josiah. So we see this king Josiah, and you know, he was a great king. The Bible says there was like no Passover that in such a long time than he had performed. He restored the, the, the word of God. He, re, he restored the, the temple. He restored a lot of things. He was bringing people back to the word of God in a very dark time. I mean, this is not that far from Jerusalem being destroyed, you know, for the first time by the king of Babylon with a great destruction. But we see Josiah was this like shining light in the moment of darkness. But at the end of his life, he was too hasty to fight in the battle. He was too hasty to go out and get that persecution. He was too hasty to go and fight. We see uh, this in a lot of people, other people's lives in the Bible. But, you know, you don't have to go out and look for that persecution. You don't have to go out and look for the fight. Just live godly. Follow God's commandments. And if you are, He'll give you that persecution. You know. But if you go out and you just get it of strife and envy, I don't believe you're going to get any reward. 
The Bible says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet, and turn again and rend you. That's, that, if you're not following that commandment, if you're literally going out and casting your pearls before swine, how is Christ going to reward you for not following His commandments? I don't want to be persecuted and then also be sinning and also not get any reward for it. If I'm going to be persecuted, which is not a, a good thing, no chastisement at the, at the time seemeth joyous but grievous, hey, I don't want that unless it's for, for the cause of Christ. If it's going to be rewarded by God. So I'm not going to go out looking for you know, you know, how I can be persecuted. I'm not going to look for the battle that I shouldn't be in. I'm not going to take a dog by the ears with stripe belonging not unto me. I'm not going to meddle with stripe belonging not unto me. Go to Proverbs 18 if you would. We need to just serve God and be patient. What's the opposite of being hasty? Just be patient. Be patient with the Lord. Be patient to make your riches. Be patient following His commandments. We shouldn't be quick to anger. Look at Proverbs 18, verse 13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. You know, a lot of people today, especially you know, in the modern evangelical churches and stuff like that, they want to correct you on your doctrine. But you know what's interesting? You'll say, hey, what does the book of Jeremiah say? There's like this one main theme in the book of Jeremiah. It's the second largest book in the Bible. What is, it talk, what, what is the one theme of Jeremiah? They couldn't even tell you. You say, what's Isaiah about? Oh, I don't know. What's Ezekiel about? I don't know. Have you ever read the Bible cover to cover? No. Oh, but I'm interpreting it wrong. Oh, but I don't know what the Bible says. Why don't you just read the Bible one time cover to cover before you start correcting people, before you start giving your judgment about what the Bible says? We shouldn't be too hasty to correct somebody about something we don't even know. That's just foolish. That's just unlearned. That's just ignorant. If you're ignorant of what the Bible says, don't go around telling people what it says. Hey, you're not interpreting that right. Well, have you ever read it? No. How do you know that I'm not interpreting it right? How do you know I don't know what the Bible says? Don't correct somebody if you don't even have any knowledge of the subject. Don't correct somebody if you, don't even, you haven't even read the Bible yourself. Hey, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. We see the Bible says you must have two witnesses before you make any judgment. You know, we shouldn't even base anything off of hearsay. We shouldn't be so hasty. Someone comes and tells us something, we shouldn't just immediately believe it and respond to that and go out and do something with it. That's hearsay. Do we have two witnesses? Is there something else that can verify what you're telling me? Because guess what? If you only have one witness, I'm not going to do anything about it. Is it clear evidence? Are you going to get the information from the horse's mouth? I've been so... There's been so many times where someone's told me something. Somebody I trust. Okay? But it wasn't from them, it was like told to them, okay? And then I and then when I hear it from the actual person, it's way different. I mean, it's not even kind of the same. I'm not going to take any information that's gone through the gossip tree, gone through the, the phone call game. I'm not going to take that for, you know, any kind of uh, uh, something I should act on. Any kind of judgment that I make. I'm not going to make judgment on hearsay. I'm not going to make judgment on unclear evidence. I'm not going to make judgment when I don't even hear it from the horse's mouth. Why don't you make diligent inquisition whenever you're making a judgment? But people today, they're so hasty in their judgments. They're so hasty to judge, to, to give out dull their judgment. You know, they'll even be saying it while they're saying, we shouldn't judge. We shouldn't judge. Don't judge. But I think you're, you're, you're interpreting the Bible wrong. Oh, are you judging me? I mean, I mean, the Bible today is so clear about what it says, but people don't know what it says, and they're constantly wanting to rebuke you because of false preaching, because of false understanding. It's just like the telephone game. Somebody tells somebody something, and they tell somebody something, and they tell somebody something, and then all of a sudden, people are making all these decisions and judgments based on that knowledge. That's how it is with the Bible. You get a false prophet parroting some false doctrine they read in a commentary, and then it gets perverted by the next guy that hears it, perverted by the next guy. By the time it gets to the pew, I mean, they're just listening. It's like a Gandhi quote. I mean, I mean, they don't even know what the Bible says at all. They're just, they're ignorant. They're sodas children. They're foolish. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. If we're going to make judgment, Jesus said, judge not after the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We shouldn't be hasty to judge somebody. Hey, you know, I, I want to know the Bible and I want to be able to give righteous judgment. Okay, read the Bible. Read the Bible one time. Read the Bible two times. Read the Bible five times. Read the Bible ten times. Now you can give righteous judgment. 
Now you know what the Bible says. Go to Proverbs 29 if you would. The Bible says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 17, At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 19.15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin, and any sin that he sin, at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. You know, that also goes with just interpreting the Bible in general. If you see one passage say something, but you can't find it anywhere else in the Bible, you can't find two or three witnesses of what you're seeing, don't believe it. Every word is established by two or three. Hey, I saw this one story, this one guy say something, or, hey, I saw one person say something in Acts. I mean, is that true? Well, do you have two or three witnesses? No. Then that's not a doctrine of the Bible. That's not something... Take the clear statements of the Bible. Take two or three or four or a hundred witnesses. I mean, that's how people get all these false doctrines. They just have their one witness. They have their James chapter 2. They have their Acts 2.38. They have whatever it is. They have their one verse... But then they can't confirm it with two or three witnesses. It falls apart when they're trying to get that other witness to come in. For the second time, I have to skip a little bit of my notes, but look at Proverbs 29. Uh, I think I had the reference wrong. I'm sorry. Go, go to Proverbs 29, verse 7. The righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. You know what? This is a huge topic. It's probably his own sermon itself. We, not, we need to not be hasty to trust people. We need to be hasty not to trust people in a lot of areas. Okay, One would be, how about the guy standing on the corner begging for money? Hey, I was in, I'm a vet, and I, you know, I love America, and I've served, and I do all these things. They got the little billboard. Don't trust that. That guy's a liar. That guy probably didn't even, he probably didn't even fight with army men when he was growing up. But he's going to say, oh, I'm a vet, and you know, I'm disabled. He's standing there taking your money. Why can't he go out and get a job? Yeah. And you know, there's so many jobs today where you're sitting. I mean, I work with tons of people that are even disabled. And they make really good money. I mean, you don't... You, we need to not trust people in a lot of areas. You know, one area would be with our children. We shouldn't just, hey, I just met this guy, you know, yesterday, and he invited my kids over. Let's just take them over there. Let's just bring them over. Let's just... Let him stay with whoever we want. Hey, I know this guy's a drunkard in my family, but I'm just going to let him hang out with him. Hey, I know my family, you know, some of their best friends are sodomites, and they're going to have them over at dinner. I'm going to drop my kids off with them tonight. No. We need to not just trust people with, with things that are precious unto us. We need not be hasty to trust people. Hey, I just met this guy yesterday, and I gave him my wallet and my car and my key. I mean, be not quick to trust anyone, period. I don't think you should trust anybody that you initially meet. Ever. For any reason. For any, even the smallest matter. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 2, And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. You know, a lot of people, they're quick to just drop their kids off at daycare, drop their kids off with strangers, drop their kids off with just whoever. And guess what? When parents and their kids are separated, bad things happen in the Bible. I mean, we see a bunch of kids by themselves running out. Oh, they're just teared, torn in two by two she-bears. But people today, they just quickly trust strangers. I was going to read for the, the story, but there's a story in uh, Joshua where the children of Israel are going to inherit the land. And they're just destroying everybody. God's just giving them deliverance. They're just wiping out their enemies. I mean, there's some battles where the children of Israel, none of them died. But the children, the, the children of Gibeon, the, hit, the Hivites, there's a certain group of them, they come onto the children of Israel and they trick them. They, they prepare, you know, their saddles with the, to look really old sacks of mildew and moldy bread and old vessels of, of wine that have, have spilled or burst. And they're like, hey, we came on this long journey because we heard how great the Lord is. Can we be your servants? You know, I guess just because of all the flattery, Joshua falls for it. He doesn't inquire of the Lord. And what? He just accepts them. And then it becomes a snare unto them for the rest of their lives. The Hivites are dwelling in the land. And they have to dwell with them forever. They, 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 their enemies trick them. Why? Because they just immediately trusted what they said. People will lie to you today. There's so many stories in the Bible where people are just lying to one another. Even men of God are lying. I mean, David's committing all kinds of wicked sins by lying. He literally gives 
his friend a letter of death and has him go, go take it to the army captain to then kill him. Uriah. Yeah, he sleeps with his wife and then hands him a letter to deliver that's going to kill him. I mean, don't trust anybody. Don't, don't just put all your trust in people. Don't be quick and hasty to trust people. All men are liars, is what the Bible says. Now, it might be out of context, but it's true. All men are liars, the Bible says. Go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It'll be the last place we turn. There's a lot of ways that we need to not trust men. But my last point is that I think today people, unfortunately, they're too hasty to go through the life stages. They're too hasty to go to the next stage. Teenagers today, they just can't wait until they're in college. College kids, they can't wait until they're this young adult. Young adults today, they can't wait until they're married. People that are married, they can't wait until they have kids. People that have kids, sometimes they can't wait to be a grandparent. And then by that time, they're like, man, I wish I could go back and start it all over again. I mean, but we see that people today, they're not satisfied with where they're at. They're not content with the situation that they're in. They're always looking to the future. They're always looking to the greener grass. They just, they're just too distracted on the future that they can't focus on the present. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We need to be taking advantage of every second we have. People today that, well, I'll take care of that later. You know what, I'll start serving God when, you know, I get everything right. And when I, you know, maybe when I'm out of college, because right now I'm in college, I'm having a lot of fun. So, you know, I'll serve God when I get out of college. And then, well, you know, I'm kind of young. I, I'm just going to, I'll serve God when I get married. Well, she wasn't really godly, so maybe I'll wait until we have some kids. Once we have kids, then we'll start going to church. Then we'll start living godly. Well, maybe when they become teenagers, maybe by that time we'll start living. You know what? Before you know it, your life's going to be over and you're not going to have done anything for God. Now is the day to serve the Lord. Now is the time. You know, there was a guy that was rich and he thought he was going to have all the time in the world in the Bible. He thought, he, oh, I'll, I'll go to the city tomorrow. And the Lord says, thou fool, tonight I'm going to require your life. Tonight you're going to die. We never know when we're going to die. We never know when the last moment is. You need to serve God now. Think about Abraham. You know, God had given this promise to have a son. But you know what? He didn't want to wait for that. So he decided to sleep with his handmaiden, Hagar. And he got Ishmael. What a horrible decision. What a horrible decision he made. He was too hasty in his life. He couldn't just wait for the children to come naturally. He had to go out and do it his own way and cause all this sin and have this great enemy of the children of Israel. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. The Bible says that we should be patient. It says in Psalms 37, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. The Bible says in James chapter 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, <coughs> unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman that waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth <coughs> nigh. We as God's people need to be patient today. We need not be hasty in all of our matters. We need not be hasty in anger. We need not be hasty in our fornication and the offices of God that's given us and our life stages and trusting people. There's so many areas of our life that we could be hasty in and riches. We need to just trust in the Lord and be patient. Serve Him now, but be patient with your life. Be patient and run the steady race. Christianity is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And if we're just hasty in all of our matters, you're going to end up in hindsight regretting the decisions you made and having to redo them, and a lot of times redoing them not as well as you could have the first time. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you for all the promises and gifts that you give us. I pray that we would all with patience endure patiently to receive the prizes and the callings that you've given us in this life. That we take advantage of every moment that we have, but that we would be patient to receive the fruit in its due time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.